Job went every morning and sacrificed to the Lord for each of his ten children, lest they be guilty even in their hearts of even some unknown sin. He was a rich man, and his sacrifices would have been substantial, sheep or goats and bulls, all without blemish. His bare arms would have been stained and hot with blood. Perhaps the blade was flint, perhaps bronze. Blood would soak the foot of the altar, making the stones shine and turning dust into mud. Being a sin offering, the visceral fat would have been burned. The smoke rose as a sweet savor to the Lord. The stink of urine and feces remained with Job, attracting flies. On his son's birthday, his eldest son, his firstborn, various messengers came to Job. This would have been later in the day, after all his sacrificing had been done, after he had washed his hands and arms clean, and sent his blood-spattered priestly robe to its daily laundering. That morning's sacrifice would have been a special occasion, since his children had all gathered to celebrate the day. Such was their custom to gather for birthdays, but this was the firstborn, he of the double portion. So the festivities would have been especially grand, all the more occasion for unwitting sin, Job knew, and his sacrificing would have been a spectacle of bloodshed. He was too busy with this matter to observe the day with his children. He knew his priorities, and was not wrong in this. Did he spy the first messenger come running from the south? Was he like that other father of the prodigal son, constantly scanning the horizon for some sign or word? Did Job wonder at the servant's haste, grow uneasy at the breathless desperation of the man? Was he patient, waiting as the man doubled over before him, gasping for air to utter the words? Sabians, oxen and asses, massacre. Of course, Job was angry. He was a ruler of the land. He was greatest of the sons of the east, and his mind would have raced with plans to organize his many men to pursue the raiders, to hunt them down and kill them and retake what was his. Thus, two centuries before, had Abram rescued Lot from Chedorlaomer and Tidal, Amraphel and Arioch. It would not stand, and no excuse that years of famine unsettled all the world. Alas, Job had not time for this. Unseen behind him, as he listened, rushed a second messenger. Fire from the east, sheep and men, all killed. Had it sounded like distant northern thunder to Job earlier in the day, perhaps during his sacrificing? Did he wonder at the pall of smoke dark in that quarter of the sky? Was his soul stirred with unease, knowing his sheep were grazing in those spring pastures? But there would have been no thought of anger at God in this. It would not have occurred to him, and nothing to be done about it in any event. He would have seen this immediately and returned to the thought of retaking his herds from the Sabaeans. But immediately the third servant races from the east. Chaldeans, camels, massacre. Camels are the beasts of trade, the foundation of Job's wealth, dealing in spices and incense and oils and cloths. The Sabaeans would have to wait, or at least take second priority. So Job would have been thinking, even as the servant still babbled out his story. But then, then, a final messenger. From the fourth quarter of the land, a great wind, house collapsed, all your sons and all your daughters, dead. Struck from the four corners of the earth in a season of troubled skies and restless nations, he had shed no tears, felt no grief before. Even anger would have waited upon justice. But his sons, his daughters, crushed beneath the stones and great beams of a house that he had built, Job fell down. How long he lay, we cannot know. We know he fell because he then arose, and being a man of his culture, he tore his clothes. I would have, would have hid my face in one hand, the other across my belly.